begin a new series today. We're going to look at Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. So as, as is often the case when, when we start a series, I like to go four-wheeling, as it were, through the text and uh, kind of get the lay of the land. So, but before we do that, let me tell you a little bit of a story. On the 15th of March, in the year 44 B.C., before Christ was born and uh, some 2,000 plus years ago, two senators in the Roman Senate, one named Brutus and one named Cassius, led a group of people who had invited a rather reluctant Julius Caesar to the theater built by Pompey in Rome. And Julius Caesar had been elected by the Senate to be Caesar for life. You see, the Roman Empire was really a, it was a republic before this point, and Julius Caesar began to take on the accolades of humans and began to uh, think of himself as rather a god. And so Brutus and Cassius, in hopes of maintaining the republic, led an assassination on Julius Caesar, and they stabbed him to death there in that theater. And it's one of the first recorded autopsies of a human being recorded in history. Uh, he was stabbed 23 times, and apparently it was just one, one knife wound that cut into his aorta, and he bled out that, that killed him. Two years later, in the year 42 B.C., um, Brutus and Cassius had sort of taken hold or taken control of the eastern half of the Roman Empire in Greece and Turkey and those places, and they had armies at their disposal, and they met in battle with Mark Antony and uh, Octavian, who was the adopted son of Julius Caesar, and they met in battle at Philippi, the place to which this letter is written. And they fought two major battles, a couple days apart, and the assassins were defeated. Cassius, on the first day of their battle, heard a rumor that Brutus had been defeated. It wasn't true, but he thought he was done for, and he committed suicide which was what leaders of armies did in those days because it was better than facing what they were facing if they were taken in defeat. And so two days later, Brutus had managed to gather the two armies together, but he still lost there in the marshes and on the plains at Philippi. And he committed suicide as well. And so Mark Antony and Octavian were victors that day. And they made Philippi, they, they took the soldiers and the officers of the opposing armies because they were all Roman soldiers, all veterans, all good combat soldiers. And they made them swear loyalty now to this new configuration. And many of those officers were given land in Philippi and the surrounding country around Philippi. Because one of the things that they didn't like doing was giving too much land away around Rome because they liked to save that as gifts for their really wealthy friends. Uh, their world was a very uh, corrupt one. But Philippi became a small version of Rome. It was laid out the same way. The architecture was the same. Uh, the coinage was the same, and they had the same legal privileges as Rome did. And Philippi was an important city because it was on the main road uh, from southern Europe to Asia, which would be modern-day Turkey and beyond. And so, more than a hundred years later, the Apostle Paul came to the city of Philippi. 
he and Silas, and it was on what we call Paul's second missionary journey. And so if we, we can start four-wheeling around now, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, the book of Acts comes after the four Gospels. The four Gospels cover the same span of time as each other from the birth to the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then the book of Acts takes us from the ascension of Jesus and the beginning of the church all the way to the end of Paul's ministry. And so it's really the story of, uh, first of all, the story of Jesus in the Gospels and then the story of Jesus' people in the book of Acts. And so in Acts chapter 16, if you want to look down at verse 11, I'm just, I'm going to skip down through this fairly quickly, but he starts with the word we. We means that Luke, who wrote this book, was with the band that he's talking about. We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace, and the next day we landed at Neapolis. Beautiful place. Mediterranean. From there we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia. See, Macedonia and Greece were kind of together there. And it was a Roman colony. And we stayed there several days. Several days as in long enough to plant the church. We plant churches over years. He did it in a few days. Verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. Now that's important. Where did Paul always go on the Sabbath when he came to a new place? He went to the synagogue. That was the first place he brought the gospel, always. This means that this city of Philippi, which he says is a major city, had no synagogue. They didn't like Jews. Uh, there were still Jewish people there, but they were not a big influence. And so when there was no synagogue in a, in a city, very often they would meet outside the city somewhere uh, along a body of water. And so uh, he says, we, we went looking for that and we sat down to speak with some women who gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, and she was a merchant of expensive purple cloth a businesswoman who worshipped God. So she was there for that meeting. She was coming to where the Jews met, and she was not Jewish. She was not a convert to Judaism, but she was what we call, what's called in the scriptures, a God-fearer. She thought it made a lot of sense what they were reading out of the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Writings, and what they were saying about who God is and what life means. So she worshipped God. Uh, continuing on here in verse 14, as she listened to us, that is Paul and Luke and Silas and whoever else was with them, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household, that is her oikos, we've used that word before, were baptized, and she asked us to be her guests. So her household would be uh, whoever lived in her house. That is, any relatives or family of hers. She probably was a widow, perhaps a widow, and uh, might have had children, other relatives, employees, slaves, um, in her household that lived with her, that she fed, that took care of her business, those people were all baptized. Now, when you hear this word oikos, think of our sheets that we have called my world. That's what that's based on. It's based on what is my oikos. My oikos is my area of influence. And so that's what she was, she was bringing to be baptized was her, the people she had influence over. And she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. And so they came and stayed there. Now, it goes on, the story goes on, 
and it says that there was this slave girl who uh, was demon possessed and Paul cast this demon out of her and the people that owned this slave girl were very upset about that because they made a lot of money off of her because she could tell uh, the future for people. And so go down to verse 19. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So uh, they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They don't like Jews, and they don't distinguish between Jewish people who follow Jesus and Jewish people who don't know anything about Jesus or just don't follow him anyway. All the same to them. They shouted this to the city, city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal, illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. And the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Now, we pass over that fairly quickly, and I think Luke goes by it fairly quickly because it happens so much in their world. But I want you to think about, for a second, to have a whole bunch of people just come and grab you right now and drag you out of here, out to the parking lot, and tear your shirt off and tie your hands up to one of the posts that holds up the, the, the porch out there, and beat your back with wooden rods until you were bleeding and swollen and absolutely humiliated. That's what we're talking about. And Paul had received this treatment many times. Verse 23, they were severely beaten. And then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet on with stocks, on the stocks. So at this point, I want to stop and just think for a minute. Um, I think there's probably no disagreement in all of human history about what a day like this would be for Paul and Silas. This would be a bad day, wouldn't you say? This is not a joyous occasion on any level. They're now inside of some dungeon, probably can't really stand to have their clothes on their back because their flesh is flayed. They don't want the serum and the blood coming out of their back to, to get into the cloth and get it stuck on there. I mean, it's that kind of misery. And here's one of the most amazing verses in all the Bible to me at verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Wow. Wow. And so this right here, they're in Philippi. This is going to be the foundation for our understanding and the definition of what joy is when Paul talks about joy in his letter. He had joy in this dungeon at night in great pain and misery and wrongly arrested, by the by. And so what you see next in the story is that there's an earthquake and all the, the, the bonds came loose off the prisoners and the jailer who had been instructed, and this is his contract with the Romans to take care of these things, and if you lose a prisoner they're going to require your life in place. So he had his sword out ready to do himself in, like Brutus and Cassius did, because it's better than letting the Romans get their hands on you, you see. And Paul said, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. Go down to verse 29. The jailer called for lights, ran to the dungeon, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, And then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everybody in your oikos, your household, because you're the papa there and you speak for the whole family. That was the Roman world and the Greek world, how they operated. 
And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household, his oikos. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And then he and everybody in his oikos, his household, were immediately, immediately baptized. That is the biblical response to becoming a believer, is to get baptized right now. So if you haven't done that, there's a little... Uh, There's a little thought for you. Going on, he brought them, the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and he and his entire oikos, his household, rejoiced. They had joy because they all believed in God. What you got here, folks, is the beginning of the church at Philippi. You got Lydia's oikos, and you got the jailer's oikos. Two households that had all kinds of people in them were now joined together as brothers and sisters in Jesus the Messiah. That's something. And all Paul had to do was just get beaten up really badly for it and tell the truth. Well, that's the beginning of the church at Philippi. Now, uh, they were released and uh, Paul stood up and wouldn't allow them to, to silently let them slip out of town. He said, actually, we are Roman citizens, and you've beaten us publicly without a trial. And they're like, oh, my goodness. And they, couldn't, they were stumbling over themselves to apologize to Paul and Silas. Uh, so it says here in verse 40, uh, they begged them to leave the city in verse 39. And then when Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. They didn't leave the city because they still had some business to do. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. So your church has just been born. We're going to encourage you. And it says, then, then they left town. There you go. There's your church right there. No denomination, no nothing to help. Now, you're in the book of Acts. Let's, Let's move on a few chapters and go to chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. And you'll notice Acts chapter 20 begins with the word uproar. You see the word uproar and the name Paul in the same sentence a whole lot in the book of Acts, because he's that guy. There's always something, because he just can't let good enough alone. He has to speak the truth. Now, when the uproar, that is the uproar in Ephesus, was over, Paul sent for the believers, the new church, and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye, and he left for Macedonia, that is the place where Philippi is. While there, he encouraged the believers in all the towns he passed through. So he was coming back to Philippi. He traveled down to Greece then. He stayed there for three months. He was preparing to sail back to Syria, when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life, so he decided to return through Macedonia, back to Philippi. Um, So then look down at verse 6. He lists all his traveling companions there. Verse 6, after the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia, and five days later joined them. Now, that's interesting, because he's saying they're here in this Gentile place that does not like Jews, and they celebrate the Passover. So we know from 1 Corinthians that Paul uh, had that Gentile church, which was also in Greece, celebrating the Passover. And now we see the church at Philippi, very likely the church at Philippi, celebrating the Passover, because what else would they do? They were followers of the way. It was a commanded holiday. And so that's part of why we celebrate the Passover, because the church in the New Testament and the book of Acts did that very thing. That's how we understand um, what God has done, how he has brought redemption. He redeemed his people out of slavery, and now he redeems us out of the slavery of sin. And that is marked uh, every time we celebrate this uh, communion table together. These elements are from the Passover story. Okay, let's move to the very end of the book of Acts. Chapter 28 and verse 16. 
Luke says, when we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own lodging. Paul's under arrest now, and he's going to be tried before Caesar. Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Move down to verse 30. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense, virtually under house arrest. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. This is probably, this is likely where Paul was when he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. And so he talks about these Philippian people and the Macedonians in these little towns in Macedonia when he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'll just read this to you. Uh, He says, now I want you to know, dear brothers, he's writing to the Corinthians, and I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy. Ah, so this is going to end up in our letter here, which has overflowed in rich generosity. He was collecting up money to take to the believers in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers there who were being absolutely persecuted uh, in every possible way and being trying, they were trying to starve them out of the city and out of the country. Uh, And so he, he was collecting money for them. And so we get this little bit of background uh, to get us started um, in this uh, letter to the Philippians. So now if you would turn to the book of Philippians, turn to that letter, We'd like to look at just the first part and just take a few applications with us today as we go. Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to start with the centerpiece of this section, which is verse 6. And I'm going to read it to you in a different translation because it's actually the middle of a sentence. But this translation makes it like it's the whole sentence, so, so it's helpful. Chapter 1, verse 6 of Philippians says, I am sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Messiah Jesus. That's the main deal. That's what we've got to say here today. That's what we have to learn today. There had been 10 years since Paul was first in Philippi, sitting in that dungeon, until now when he's sitting in house arrest in Rome, writing back to them. And he had been through there every once in a while, uh, sent people to help them, uh, had received people from them to help him when he was in in prison and in trouble. And that was his relationship with them. And this church was thriving and surviving and thriving um, for 10 years. One commenter has said, believers in Christ, with reference to this verse, this verse says, I am sure this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Believers in Christ are people of the future. A sure future that has already begun in the present. And these people, that is us who are in Christ, Live the life of heaven, the life of the future in the present, in whatever circumstances they find themselves. Amen? All right. Amen. So, so please put up that first slide, if you would, Brandon. We've got a whole new uh, suite of software up there, and we haven't quite figured out the, uh, the uh, app for my cell phone, so I can do that. God carries us all the way. He carries us all the way on this path to himself on that day. And since he carries us on that path, we need to choose to pray with joy. Let me read to you the beginning of chapter 1, and you can follow along with me. Paul and Timothy, slaves 
of Messiah Jesus to all the holy ones, all the saints. Now, some of us come from different backgrounds where we, we attach the title saint to people like Paul and John. And indeed, they are saints. But what that misses is the fact that every one of us in Christ is a saint, which means a sanctified one, a holy one. That's who we are in Christ. And so to all the holy ones in Messiah Jesus who are in Philippi, along with the elders and the deacons, grace to you and shalom, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus the Messiah. I thank my God, he says, at every memory of you, every time I think about you, always praying with joy in every prayer of mine for you all because of your sharing in the good news from the first day until now. Ten years of road together, Paul says, we've had. And we share, we are co-partners in this gospel. We are in Christ together. And he chooses to pray with joy. He chooses to accentuate the positive. Now we think, well, that's kind of phony. But we live in a world that accentuates the negative. And God says, I want you to accentuate the positive, And I'll tell you why. Because those are the things. It's just like a funeral. When I was young, I thought... Well, you can't just pray someone into heaven by saying good things about them after they die. But then as I studied the book of Hebrews, I realized in chapter 11, whole chapters and chapters and chapters of story about Abraham and David and all these guys that did a lot of bad stuff, actually, gets boiled down to a paragraph, two paragraphs. The good stuff. Most of what goes on in our life is wood, stubble, hay stubble. It just burns up. It's dust on the counter that's going to get wiped off. It's smoke in the kitchen that's going to blow out as soon as we open the windows. That's what most stuff in life is. And the important stuff, the eternal stuff, that's what really matters. That's why he chooses to pray with joy when he thinks of them. Because believe me, they had plenty of problems. And he had plenty of problems when he was in Philippi. It wasn't just, a, oh, let's, let's come and have a wonderful time and we'll start a church. He got beaten up. How do you like us so far, Paul? He prays with joy. Remembering Lydia's household and the jailer's household and all the other people that have come along because of this good news. They were sharing in the gospel, and Paul lived on that. There's always plenty to worry about, but what really counts? Everything distracts us to the negative side. Anybody who's trying to tell you what he calls, or she calls, news, is going to tell you the worst stuff they can think of. Why? Because they want you to keep watching. Anybody that's talking to you about politics and you should vote for me what are they trying to get you to they're trying to get you to worry about what the other guy is going to do advertising is trying to make you worry you're insufficient in this way your life could be so much better you could be look like this this be in this resort with all this sand and beautiful people and music and wah 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 sounds a little boring after a while but that's what they're trying to sell you should be like that. You could do this. That's what the world does. They need us to worry. And Paul is telling us to have joy. Despite whatever is going on. In Christ, ultimately, there are, as they say in the Caribbean, no worries. No worries, man. Yeah? In Christ. Choose the joy that God gives over the darkness and trouble that the world gives. And that's a choice. We make that choice. And when you make that choice, 
When you choose that joy, when you choose to live as a glass half full person, well, I may have all kinds of troubles, but I am the Lord's child. And that means more than all that other stuff. And when you do that, when you make that choice, when I make that choice, it is really hard to do. It is really hard to do. I think it's harder in a wealthy culture than it is in a poor culture. I think poor people understand their need far more clearly than we do. What do I need God for? I got food, I got clothes, I got a house, I got this, I got that, ba 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 And that's why the wealth of the West has allowed it to drift away from the truth of what built up that wealth in the first place, which was the knowledge of God and Jesus the Christ. That's what made it great in the first place. But we've ignored that. But when you choose to live by that joy, your friends will see that. Your critics will see that. Your co-workers will see it. Your fellow students will see it. Your spouse will see it. That might even encourage them. Your children will see it. That's really big. That will help them understand how to live in the rhythm of that life that God is giving us. So we are, when we do that, we are bringing God's joy into the darkness of the world. All right, let's put that other, the next slide up, please. God carries us all the way, remember, to completion, the work that he started in us, on that path, on that joyous path. So, not only uh, do we um, choose to pray with joy, we keep other grace nicks in our hearts. You know the word grace nicks? I made it up. <laughs> somebody who's a nick is somebody who, who is involved in, in it. We are fellow grace nicks, if I could say it that way. We are all here because of God's grace. We believe in it. Grace is really just about God's gift. We like gifts. We like Christmas gifts. We like birthday gifts and any other kind of gift we can get. And the best gift of all is the gift that God has given us in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So, so we are gifted people. Not because we're just born that way, but because we've been given something. And so we are to keep one another in our hearts. Let's, let's read on past verse 6, which is the centerpiece. Let's, let's start at verse 7. Paul says, it is right for me to feel this way about you. Well, that's, you know, that's really something from Paul. He's, he's not a feelings kind of guy, usually. But it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. For you are all partakers of grace with me. We're all grace nicks. We are part, we're partakers of grace. We're receivers of the gift, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the good news. Caesar is going to hear the good news from Paul's mouth at this trial. And the leaders of Rome in, in Palestine, what it would be later called in Israel, really, had heard the good news from the mouth of Paul because he was a prisoner. And so Paul says, For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the affection of Messiah Jesus. And so grace and joy are related. If you look at the words in Greek, they are lexically uh, related. You can see they come from the same uh, words. But they're conceptually the same as well. Grace is why we have joy. We have joy because we have great gifts from God. We believe now, we believe in facts before feelings. And we get that from Paul. He's very big on understanding, and he's going to talk about that later. But he loves this emotion of joy. The joy of having God's gift, all of us together. Having God's gift. That's a great thing. So we're partners in grace. Now, I have uh, been asked, and I wrote a short paper and made a short video for this interdisciplinary conference that 
our friend Dr. Foley Legunda is putting together in Kinshasa later uh, this month. I'm not going to Kinshasa, uh, but I made this video so he could show that. And it was very funny to see, you know, he, he sent me a copy of the poster for this conference. And there's my little face. And I just don't look very African, actually. <laughs> Best I can tell, because a lot of the other people on that poster are Africans. But we are fellow grace necks. We are participants, we are par partakers, receivers of the gift. And what a blessing that is. That this last week, World Outreach Week, our, our, our missions conference, reminded us that we're fellow partakers with people all over the world. This church, I mean, this church is not a consumer choice. It is a living community of God that we belong to. It's a God's community of joyful grace necks. Okay, let's put that last slide up, please. Finally, this. God, as we are reminded, God's work in us carries us all the way to completion on this path. So, Paul says, let our love overflow. Let's read it, verse 9, as we, as we close this, this passage. Now this I pray, that your love might overflow still more, and more in the knowledge and in the depth of discernment. So Paul's going back to where this is based. This isn't just feeling because I, I, I ate the right food. No. This is feeling based on fact. I pray that your love might overflow more and more in knowledge and depth of discernment in order to approve what is excellent. To approve what is excellent. Accentuate the positive. Because that's really what's going to last in the day of the Lord. What's going to be there when, when everything else is burned away? Love, joy, peace, our love for one another. That's going to stand forever. So we're doing this in order to approve what is excellent, so that in the day of uh, Messiah, you may be sincere and blameless. You can just stand right up and be who you are, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus the Messiah to the glory and praise of God. Amen? Now, you know, I don't know exactly what this all looks like all the time. But I want to know what this looks like. I want, it know, I want to know what it looks like to have, uh, to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And so if I don't think about it, if I don't pray about it, if I don't study it, if I don't have conversations with you about it, if I don't search for it, if I don't knock on the door, I'll never get there. I won't know what it's about. But I want to have love overflowing in knowledge and the depth of discernment. And I want all of us to have that. And so this path to joy, this path to joy starts here. That God carries us the whole way on this path to the day of the Lord and he's asking us to choose joy, choose to pray for each other with joy, and to keep one another in our hearts. We're in this together. And finally, to let our love overflow. Easy? No, I don't think it's easy. I, I've had, you know, kind of an ongoing metaphorical headache this week. Because there have been a number of people who have been sort of at odds about how to do this ministry. And the, the long and the short of it is, at the end of the story, at the end of the week, I can have joy because what I know is that the people who are working these things out are far, far, far more important to me. They're far more important to the Lord, far more important to the kingdom of heaven than any of this disagreement will be. This disagreement is just a puff of smoke that's going to blow away. It's a bit of dust that's going to get wiped away. It'll be gone. But we, 
in Christ, we remain. Us graceniks. So let's be graceful to one another this week. Let's pray.